SJC 12032, Frederick Clay v. Massachusetts Parole Board. Good morning, Mr. Harris. Just give us a moment. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice. Wait one second so we can get the clock going and then save that thought. Take all right, all yours. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the court, my name is Jeffrey Harris. I'm here representing Frederick Clay. After more than 35 years in prison, juvenile homicide offender Fred Clay first saw the parole board in May of 2015. When did he become eligible for parole? He became eligible for parole, well, he should have become eligible for parole in 1994. When did he, in fact, become but he, eligible I, I guess for at the time that Diachenko was decided in yeah. uh, December of 2013. So at that point, the statute had already been enacted. Um, well, arguably, under federal law, it, it, he became eligible. He had a meaningful opportunity for release under Miller um, in June of 2012. But, but, but yes, at that point, the statute had already become enacted. But um, do you, you probably address this. At the time that he committed the crime, back in whenever, um, uh, was it a majority vote? It was. Approval? It was, Your Honor. So al although a majority of the parole board this time around found Clay suitable for parole, a vote that would have allowed for a grant of parole at the time of the crime, um, the board nevertheless applied the 2012 supermajority amendment to 133A <coughs> to effectively overrule the majority and deny Mr. Clay a parole. Why is the date of the crime the relevant date? Um, because ex post facto law looks back to when the date of the crime was. Now, well, it, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Well, I, it, it's also because Diachenko says it's retroactive, so it goes back to, in, in, a, in other words, the eligibility for parole is uh, Yes, I mean, that, that has to be a piece of this, right? This the eligible the eligibility for parole under Diachenko and Brown um, would have been 1994 because it's, he would have gotten 15 years after um, his uh, the crime, which would have been 1994. Now, as I understand your argument, I, it essentially is the U.S. Supreme Court already decided this case in Garner versus Jones. And that when, the, when, when it wrote in the case before us, referring to that case, respondent must show that as applied to his own sentence, the law created a significant risk of increasing his punishment, which says that the denial of parole or that, 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 that parole is within the realm of punishment and that all that you need to show is that there's, there's a significant risk that the change since the crime will increase his punishment. And you say the 4-3 vote demonstrates that. I mean, isn't, isn't this the case essentially to which the U.S. Supreme Court has decided? I believe that this case is a very straightforward application of Garner. Except that Garner says there is no, there's no bright line rule and you have to look at what's involved. That's right. right. Although it's hard to imagine that there would ever be someone who could so clearly show the prejudice that Mr. Clay has shown because the parole board's decision says essentially under the old, under the old rule we would have paroled you. Under the new rule, we're not going to parole you. So the, 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 the factors, as applied, I'm sorry. The factors, though, in Garner, um, do you think that they're just irrelevant to this case? Because they said in Garner that uh, the uh, referring back to Morales and basically taking the same account here didn't modify the statutory punishment imposed for any particular offenses. That happened. That's true here too. Uh, nor did the amendment alter the standards for determining either the initial date for parole eligibility or an inmate's suitability for parole. True here too. Um, did not change the basic structure and there of California's or of the uh, of Georgia's parole law. That's true here for Massachusetts as well. Um, the only factor that uh, is that it uh, um, there is nothing really discretionary in the uh, Massachusetts um, amendment, such as in the California one, which it didn't prohibit requests for earlier reconsideration based on a change of circumstances. But it certainly seems to me that the uh, Supreme Court is worried about, um, uh, it's a they, they say it's a question of particular difficulty when the discretion vested in the parole board is taken into account. That's true. Um, nevertheless, 
from Weaver to Mathis to Morales to Garner, they have ap applied ex post facto law to parole, to procedural parole issues. And um, it's pretty clear that they, they set up a, a, a significant risk standard, specifically because they were concerned that procedural rules, they didn't want procedural rules in general to become the purview of, to become under ex post facto law. But when they're really clear and there really is a significant risk of prolonging someone's incarceration, it falls right into ex post facto law, specifically because it's about the punishment. It's actually about prolonging someone's incarceration. And if, if, if discretion was, was the issue, then all of those Supreme Court cases would have been wrongly decided. Now, Barton, uh, the South Carolina case from 2013 is the only appellate decision that you're aware of that is uh, uh, sort of more or less on four all fours as far as the uh, change from a uh, majority to a two-thirds vote. That's right. I mean, so Barton is directly on point. But there's nothing else that you're aware of. We're the, only, well, we're, we're the second a, one to consider this? It's, it's, it's a very, very unique situation. Um, for someone to have gotten a vote that would have allowed for release under an old law and then make an as-applied challenge under Garner and then, and then have it and then not get released under the new rule. Um, well, I mean, other, other states' Supreme Courts have concluded that a changing in the voting formula isn't necessarily ex post facto. Well, no other Supreme Court has found that someone who actually had an as-applied challenge, as here, where their, their, their uh, incarceration was actually prolonged by virtue of this, the operation of this statute, and then found, nevertheless, so you're that, saying that there's no significant risk. I'm 35 sorry. years ago, when your client was sentenced, the parole voting mechanism in place then, regardless of countless changes in the law that may have have occurred in those 35 years must be applied. That somehow that was part of the sentence that he was guaranteed that there would only be a majority vote necessary for his parole. That's your argument. As long well, as it I, had been applied to him and he could show that it affected him in this yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just applying the constitutional applied. standard that's laid out by Garner. Yeah, I'm not sure Garner's so clear on this, frankly. Well, it's an, Garner's it, been it, interpreted several different ways. It's a typical, maybe this, maybe that. Case. Well, it says significant risk of prolonged incarceration, and it includes an as-applied challenge. And courts that have interpreted, including Barton, um, where the, which is, as far as I'm, I can tell, the only case that's really factually on point with this case, pointed to Garner and said, yeah, this is, this is a, an ex post facto violation. Counsel, does it, the fact that your client is now a juvenile, and we said in Diachinko that he has to have a meaningful opportunity for parole. Does that add anything to your argument, or would you be making the same argument if your client were not, uh, was not a juvenile at the time he was convicted? I would absolutely be making the same argument that there is a facial violation and that there's an as-applied violation to an adult. But I think that the fact that well, it he wouldn't apply to an adult because an adult. I mean, if it was a murder, because it, there's no parole eligibility. It would if it was a that, second degree. That's murder. right. Assuming second. it was a exactly. second degree. Yeah. Um, so, I, it just it's it's significantly more. It, it is more egregious for a juvenile. So your client got two things. A, he was sentenced to life without parole. So now he has a parole eligibility. But you're saying, aha, now that the court has ruled that. I can't be sentenced to life without parole. I get the rules that were in place long before I even had a right to be considered for parole. Well, I, th I think Your Honor is suggesting that two wrongs make a right, essentially. The fact that he was deprived of the right to, of, of, of parole eligibility in 1979 now should make it okay to not give him an ex post facto or to, to say that we never had an expectation well, of parole. Well, he has parole. the right as of 2012, and as of that time the, when the right became his, there was a statute had been amended and there was a different formula. But he should have had an expectation of parole in 1979. Let me, let me ask about the implications of this. Are you saying that they would apply, that the new um, 
two-thirds vote would only apply to crimes committed after the date of its enactment? Um, yeah. yeah. The, so that everyone the, who's been, since the law has been uh, amended in 2012, everyone who has been denied parole was de denied parole on a two-thirds vote. Well, they wouldn't be able to make a challenge only if it was the way that Fred Clay can. Because but they, wouldn't they be able to make it on an, an as um, a facial a facial challenge? Because you're, you're making a facial challenge as well as an as applied challenge. Well, I think that the as applied challenge is very clear here, and and I, if you if you like me to set that aside, the question is whether or not um, if you look at the heightened burden required by a two thirds supermajority instead of majority. Does that, on the face of the statute, create a significant risk? And perhaps that's a closer question than whether or not there is a significant risk to Fred Clay. But I still think absolutely that creates a significant risk. And, and the courts in Stiegler and in Rendell. So before Garner, right? Those were all before Garner cases? Rendell was a 2006 case. So oh, it was after Garner. After Garner. But uh, yes, Stiegler is, a, is, a pr Stiegler is sort of cited by uh, both sides. Um, and I acknowledge it's. It's, it's just uh, persuasive, it, it, in no way authoritative, and, and it's just worth reading. I'm not sure I understood your answer uh, to my question. Are you saying that the supermajority impinges on the now, the right that the juvenile now has to a meaningful opportunity for parole? Is, is, is that part of your, your view of this, or are you just dealing with the fact that he got four votes uh, instead of five. Yeah, only to the extent that it's applied retroactively. So the parole board now and the legislature now, can they can make any rules they want. They could, they could say that a, a 20, that the parole board has to be 20 people, it has to be all unanimous, has to be signed off by the governor. Um, and that would be within. But the thousands of prisoners that were sentenced before 2012 must be considered under the old mechanism in right. spite of the fact that the legislature has somewhat changed the formula. Right, well, well it, has it, to be, it, it has to be considered under the mechanism that was in place at the right. time but of the so so we're, talking about, we're talking about only those who, who won by 4-3. If, right. if they lost 5-2, it wouldn't matter. But how do, you, how do you know in advance, if you're the parole board, which rule you're supposed to be applying? You're basically saying that if it's a... Uh, um, crime that was committed before 2012, whenever the person is up before the parole board, then the old rule, or whatever rule was in effect at the time of the crime is the, um, for example, in 1971, was it? The uh, number of uh, members of the parole board was increased, I think. Uh, so if the crime had been committed in 1970, uh, your argument would then be, because it would certainly make it harder to win more votes, uh, even if it stayed the majority, the majority would increase. Um, yes. So you'd have to have a parole board that would be of a different number of members than it's currently constituted. Well, it would have to be not more of a burden. The, the question, um, between 1973 and 2012, it was a majority. So for people who are going to, who ha had their crimes at that time, and for whom they got a 4-3 decision, that's so, a problem. So prior but to that's 1973, only what was it, a three-person parole board? Um, 1971. 1971, prior to then. I'm not, I'm not sure. I know that in 1973 it was changed from four-fifths to a majority, but I don't, which was four-fifths of the parole board, so it, it may have been a five-person parole board. I don't know how else you could get four-fifths. but. Um, so, I mean, I, I certainly acknowledge that, that, that the, the pre-1973 cases would be a case for another day. Um, but nevertheless, as far as I can tell, it's just Fred Clay and one other person for, to whom other, this would apply. One other and that juvenile person's offender been, or one other person in the universe? No, one other person at all. Really? And that person has already been paroled, as far as I know. One other, wait a second. We have a lot of parole hearings coming up. The thousands of prisoners who are sentenced before 2012, their right. hearings are coming up. So we don't have any idea what the impact of this will be. Well, it, well, has, it, to, it has to. It has to. I mean, there's, there's two questions. One is 
if you reach the, um, it's, it's unconstitutional on its face, which on your argument, we don't have to reach in this case. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is still an open question. So what you're saying is, at least as applied, there's only one other person. Right, anyone before 2012 was already getting the majority, so there's no problem. It's only people- No, no, I'm talking about they were sentenced before 2012, they're coming up for parole after 2012. Right, so, so you would be essentially telling the parole board, you're gonna have to use, you're not gonna be able to apply the new standard to an old crime. All right, so if one is eligible, I mean, take Garner for example, one is eligible to be considered for parole in three year intervals. Once one is eligible, then there are hearings every three years. Legislature changed that to every eight years. Supreme Court says that's fine. Yes. It, that doesn't extend one sentence. If now I don't get a chance three years from now, I gotta wait eight years? Well, in, in Garner, they actually said that it may. And they, they said, we're gonna remand this case to allow the uh, inmate in that case to show the lower court why it does affect his, his case specifically, which is where the as-applied challenge comes from. And in fact, in that case, the parole board just said, okay, we're just gonna apply the, new, the old rules going forward just the way uh, uh, jo Jones had argued. So um, I don't see why the parole board couldn't do that in this case. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honors. Good morning. Good morning. Jennifer Zelnowski, Assistant Attorney General representing the Massachusetts Parole Board. The Parole Board properly applied the 2012 version of Section 133A to Mr. Clay's parole hearing that was held in 2015. The Board asserts that the change, this particular type of change that occurred in Section 133A is not substantive and does not implicate ex post facto. But, but, but that's how, not how what the get law past, says anymore. How do you get past Garner versus Jones? How do you get past the quote of the sentence I gave to him? In the case before us, respondent must show that as applied to his own sentence, which includes parole, the law created a significant risk of increasing his punishment. Hasn't he demonstrated that? He would have won. Well, yes and no, Your Honor. I, he, he's saying yeah. that he got a 4-3 vote and therefore he would have gotten out. But I think there's more to Garner than that. And I, I do think, as, as Justice Cordy pointed out, I'm not sure that Garner is that crystal clear. And if you look at the cases that have come out since then, which you start to you see it starting to, to crumble. Which, uh, points, which case are you pointing to that, that you think um, I, support your even the, even post in the most Garner? Even, I'm sorry. Post what Garner, case, what cases support your position? Support my position. Um, well, I think that the most important cases that we pointed out to your honor in our brief would be Smith out of Oregon, which similar to Barton, he was able to establish that he would have had a different um, result. Um, but what I think that case in particular shows, it had Garner in front of it, it's cited to Garner for other purposes, but when it came to voting requirements, the court went back to Collins and said, this doesn't even get into the realm of ex post facto. We're not gonna get into the ex post facto violation because it doesn't impact any of the traditional categories that, well, neither, that go Neither did the conditions in Garner, did they? Gar well, Garner directly addressed parole eligibility, Your Honor, and, and parole eligibility is part of the sentence, um, part of the, the uh, punishment that's annexed to the crime. No, it didn't. Eligibility is. Uh, no, it didn't. Garner didn't address parole eligibility. It, it press, addressed parole eligibility in terms of. But it wasn't impacted in Garner. In Garner, the, uh, that was one I just read before, was that um, uh, there's a, well, anyway, it doesn't alter the standards for determining either the initial date for parole eligibility or an unnamed suitability for parole. And I don't think that either uh, Garner or Morales. Um, had uh, those changes in terms of how often reconsideration would be done oh. affected the rules for parole eligibility. But I think parole eligibility talks to um, in, in, talks to the, the time in which he would be released. And I think in Garner, but, well, there's this no, delay no. Of, of years potentially before he gets released. And that's not what happened in this particular case. Wait, you think parole eligibility means what? I, I think what they were talking about in Garner was the concern that his, his review date was going to change from three years to potentially eight years at the discretion of the parole board. Review dates which was and changing eligi his parole eligibility are not the yeah. same thing. Right. Well, I, I, 
the way that I read that case and the way that I've seen it interpreted, it, that's what it's looking at. It's looking at when he would actually be eligible for parole. I think parole eligibility there, usually means when you first become eligible for parole. So in this case, it would be 15 years. Well, it, yes, and it became 15 years retroactively, sort of. Well, that um, means. But I mean, he wasn't, he never, I mean, you can't really go back in time. So he became eligible when Diachenko was decided in 2013. And the, at that point in time, the law had already changed to the two thirds majority. But it doesn't change any of the substance that, um, or the normal conditions that you look at in an ex post facto. It didn't change the definition of his crime, it didn't change the ultimate uh, life sentence. His, Prior to Diachenko, he didn't have a parole eligibility date. And I think some of the other cases that the board cites too in its, in its brief, um, aside from Smith, talk about um, the punishment annexed to the crime. And there, is, and there is a distinction. And I think this court also, in its footnote in Brown, starts to lay out that there's a difference between the sentence and parole eligibility versus parole. And that parole itself, actually being granted parole, is not part of the, the an punishment annexed to the crime. Well, I, I mean, I, I understand the argument, but it seems the U.S. Supreme Court has firmly rejected that. They firmly included the denial of parole within the realm of punishment in Morales and in Garner. I mean, other, otherwise, those would be very short decisions. Well, they would simply say that, that if you are sentenced to a crime, parole is a matter of grace, you have no entitlement to it, it falls outside the realm, the, the denial of parole falls outside the realm of punishment, game over. Well, but that's not what they did. They remanded it in Garner, saying that the denial of parole constitutes punishment. And the issue was whether or not this Mr. Garner could demonstrate that he would have had any reasonable chance of getting paroled before the potential eight years, as I understand it. So they've declared under that those the denial of parole is punishment, have they not? I think under those circumstances, Your Honor, but I think that both Garner and Morales also allow for some exceptions. And they, they talk continuously about not having courts micromanage all of the changes that would occur in parole. And this is one of those kind of changes. This is the type of change that shouldn't be overviewed constantly by the courts. The parole board has to be able to make some, some changes. The legislature has to be able to make some changes. And, and that's what's also talked about in Garner and Morales. And there's a case that's cited by- But I mean, uh, that, that this is a constitutional challenge. I mean, that essentially says, oh, you shouldn't, you courts should not get involved in micromanaging with this silly constitutional challenge. If it's unconstitutional, how can it be micromanaging it? We're requiring them to, to be consistent with the Constitution. I think prior cases, Your Honor, discuss that there are some, some changes that are outside of the realm of ex post facto. And we would put forward that this is that type of change. So by your argument, if we had a law which said that you can be convicted of certain crimes based on a five-sixth of the jury, and we change that to unanimous jury, you would say that's not ex post facto? Well, actually, Your Honor, that's sort of what happens in Collins, and that's what's discussed in, in that case is a change in the, um, in the jury si uh, system. And that's the case that um, Alston, that we rely on, um, cites to Smith relies on, um, as well as the cases out of Tennessee rely on. Um, it wasn't Collins? Wasn't there errors that were fixed without going back to the jury? Aside from the changing in the jury structure, I think what comes out of Collins, the, the, the primary issue that it's cited to is that changing the number doesn't impact ex post facto. Wait, 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 Collins, as I understand it, unless I'm wrong, Collins, the issue was in Texas that he was given a term of imprisonment and as well as a fine, and that was determined to be uh, unconstitutional under Texas law because you can't do both and they said okay we'll get rid of the fine that's what the issue the ex post facto issue was there how was that a but they but they go on to talk about the right to um, a jury and they talk about how the change in the jury structure has nothing to do with the definition of the crime the defense or the punishment and that's the part that gets that's the important part and that gets cited still it, and I think that's, there, there is a slight difference. And I, I want to point out as well, there's a case cited by uh, Mr. Clay in his reply brief, Biggs, out of um, California. And in that case in particular, he cites it for the proposition that um, Garner overturns all its prior superior, um, Supreme Court decisions. But that's not really what happens in that case. And in fact, that case, 
the Ninth Circuit points out that, um, that specifically Garner was addressing parole eligibility and the date in which he was eligible to be released. And they point out that there's nothing in the language of Garner that tells us about the scope of its applicability. And I would suggest, Your Honor, that that's the point here, is that Garner tells you what to do in those particular cases, but it leaves the door open for some changes to be made that just don't implicate ex post facto. And changing the voting would fall under that category. Well, because you say so. I mean, why? Uh, there, I think there are cases that suggest that there are, there are different changes, even in parole, there are different changes and that not everything should well, go down this line. Wouldn't, wouldn't how much it takes uh, to um, get paroled by virtue of needing more people to vote your way uh, be a stronger situation for creating a substantial risk uh, of prolonging someone's incarceration than the mere uh, discretionary uh, postponement of reconsideration of denials of prior parole board decisions. I, I, and because it seems to me that the Supreme Court has been very clear in saying the question is whether the amended rule creates a significant risk of prolonging respondents' incarceration. That's the test. That's the test if you go oh, down. that's the test. If you go down that road, that's well, the test. Well, if you go down what road? The road that the United States Supreme Court has gone down? <coughs> For those types of situations, but I'm suggesting that there are exceptions to the Garner. Where has the United States Supreme Court said that there are exceptions? I, I don't think it's plainly clear from that case that it applies to every single circumstance. And I, I, that, I think the Ninth Circuit also points that out. I think there are other cases that talk about, um, although pre-Garner, they talk about that there is no greater substantive burden to having to show. That's pre-Garner. Sh sure, but the, the theory and the concept is still, there's no substantive burden to having to convince more board members than there were in, the, in a prior law, and I, I point to Cummings on that one, it, it's 1997 case out of the Sixth Circuit, but they're talking about the same, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't, it predates Garner, but it certainly applies Morales and the sufficiency test, and it talks about the change in the size of the parole board, increase the number of members, and increase the size of the majority needed is procedural and simply does not implicate ex post facto under Collins. But why isn't it procedural as well to just decide, well, we're gonna, on the whole, say we'll do it every eight years as opposed to every uh, three years. Because do I th the doing it every eight years versus every three years is really substantively changing. Well, that's not the what sentence. the United States Supreme Court found. Well, counsel, if, if they change the number of people who have to vote, I mean, they're not doing that to make it easier. They're doing it to make it more difficult, right? Yes, that was so the intent of the change from the legislature. So just, just applying a common sense test to this, that increases the risk that the punishment will be longer. It, I mean, just plain and simple. It right? doesn't, yeah, I mean, it, it makes it harder, sure, but I don't know that that's enough. I, there are cases that suggest it's not, when it's that type of change, that it's not enough. And, and So I take it your argument is, if the parole board membership was seven, and it was a majority of votes, so you had to get four votes, and the parole statute was amended to increase the parole board to nine, but a majority vote, you'd have to get five. And would that be an extra burden because you've got to persuade five people rather than four? You would say, no, that's I would that's say we're, we're in the exact same position, Your Honor. I would say that if you look at the historical cases that talk about this type of change in parole board voting, and there's not a lot of them, but when you look at the cases that are out there, there does seem to be this exception to to th those types of changes in statutes. And those are, um, um, in addition to the Smith case in Oregon that, that I started to talk about that cites to Collins um, and indicates that Collins would be the controlling case. There's also, out of the Fifth Circuit, a case in the same thing that, that concludes that the change in voting requirements doesn't alter the definition of the crime, nor does it increase its punishment. It changes, um, it, it, the change is about uh, not about eligibility, and therefore there's no ex post facto, um, and that it just doesn't change the determinants of his parole timing or his eligibility, which makes it a little bit different in this particular case. And I also would like to point out, Your Honors, there's also um, in our own Mass Superior Court uh, has addressed, somewhat addressed this issue. There was another change in Section 133A in 1996, similar to Garner Morales, that changed the interval between the parole hearings. 
And in one of those cases, um, the Swiss case, Judge Laureate discussed Garner at length, never entertained or mentioned the as applied part of it. And this was talking about, like, almost factually on point, changing the intervals are, between are you parole hearings. Do you, I mean, do you agree uh, with Mr. Harris that indeed you can make an as applied challenge under Garner? I, I don't think. I don't think in these particular cases under this type of change that an as-applied analysis is the correct way to go. I just don't think that there is an um, ex post facto issue with this type of change because it doesn't change, it doesn't affect, as, as Judge Laureate pointed out in that particular case in Swiss, um, it doesn't affect the substantive rights because it doesn't change the nature or punishment for the crime. And it doesn't alter the rules of evidence that was required to convict. And those are the traditional ex post facto standards under Calder v. Bull, which this court has um, cited to numerous times, including um, recently in Brown in, in the footnote. And it talks about, again, that um, Judge Laurie, it talks about that the Mass Legislature should be able to adjust parole procedures and apply changes to all potential parolees. And the board would assert that this is that type of change, that the ex post facto um, isn't really implicated because of the type of change that's here. And I, th and I think if you look at even in the most recent decision out of the Supreme Court on this issue in Pew, the, um, that it's directly dealing with sentencing guidelines, which I think is somewhat different, obviously, than parole. But you can start to see that Garner is starting to crumble. Pew talks about it, but they don't really do an as-applied analysis in that case. And I think if you look at the dissent, it becomes more and more clear that it's, an, it's almost an unworkable t um, test. Okay, but and let's, let's, let's assume you're right, that Garner is crumbling. Isn't it for the U.S. Supreme Court to put an end to it as opposed to us? To put an end to it, ultimately, yes. But I, I think... Aren't we obliged to comply with it until the U.S. Supreme Court says to the contrary? I, I, I think it's not unusual for this court to disagree. And I, I think that there are... The U.S. Supreme Court? I, well, I, I think... A matter of federal law? <laughs> no, Your Honor, we I might, apologize. It didn't quite so come what? out right. What I meant was that there, are, there can be differences. And I think there are differences in this case that Garner doesn't apply, in which case this court doesn't need to apply it because it's not the same kind of change that was being discussed in Garner, the same type of parole eligibility and substantive change <coughs> to the sentence. This is not that. <coughs> So I, I apologize if I came across um, <coughs> wrong on that, Your Honor. Well, we often disagree with the U.S. Supreme Court, <laughs> but usually by providing greater rights under the Massachusetts Constitution, <laughs> not by depriving. That is, that is true, Your Honor. I, I'm sorry, Justice Lang, did you have a no. question? No. Thank you, Your Honors. All right, thank you. We're radical, but not that radical, right? <laughs>